Could I welcome you? And especially if you've come from outside the Divinity School, you are very, very welcome to this event, to this distinguished lecture. My name is Jeremy Begbie. I'm director of Duke Initiatives in Theology and the Arts here at Duke Divinity School. And it is my great, great pleasure, indeed honor, to welcome on your behalf, Julian Davis Reed, to deliver, to deliver one of our distinguished lectures. Julian is multiply qualified in so many areas, it's a struggle to cover them all. But very, very briefly, he holds a degree in philosophy from Yale, another in theology from Candler School of, Theolo of, of, of Theology at Emory. He's a musician extraordinaire, as you have been hearing and will hear, being a founding member of the jazz electronic fusion group, the Juju Exchange. He served as a campus minister for InterVarsity at Yale and has been pastor for Black Church at Yale also. He has developed a series of spiritual retreats called Notes of Rest, and he gave us a wonderful taste of that here in this chapel yesterday morning. Julian is going to speak for about 50 minutes, after which there will be time for questions, plenty of time. Could I also draw your attention to the fact that he is performing tonight at 7 o'clock in the North Star Church, uh, which really the North Star Church of the Arts in Durham, and you should have had a leaflet about that. There are plenty of places still there. Please register for that. You will not regret it. That is with one of the legends of jazz, uh, Nina Filon. Julian, we're just delighted that you're here. I hope you have felt welcomed and have felt some of the energy you give uh, reflected back uh, with our enthusiasm. You have already inspired and excited many here, and I'm sure the same will happen as you address the topic, Sounds in the Deep, a Hermeneutic of Rest for an Exhausted World. Would you welcome, please, Julian Davis-Reed. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's good to see y'all. Good to hear you. Good to play for you again. Sounds in the deep, a hermeneutic of rest for an exhausted world. I'm so delighted to talk on this topic and play a little bit about it as well, because it is such an urgent one given where we are. And so for that, thank you to Dr. Begbie and to Dita, Dr. Train, to Duke Hospitality, Dr. Smith. So good to be with you all and to be hosted by you um, and be amongst people who inspire me. So thank you. Of course, being a good artist theologian, I want to start with scripture and first prayer. God, thank you for your sound. Let us hear it. In Christ's name, amen. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said. What we see at the beginning here is that God shows up first just being and per that presence, then creating sound into the deep. What I'm here to talk about is what I've been experiencing and witnessing, researching and encountering, namely the ability for sounds to really hit us in a deep place. And from that, trying to think about why is it that sound can help us in an exhausted world? We know why we're tired. We know just how deep we're tired. And yet there's more that we can have because I think there's less that we need. And so I'm gonna read now the end of the first account of creation at the beginning of Genesis 2. And we'll see how God goes from being and sounding to then ultimately resting. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Now in between these verses, we have this huge, beautiful refrain of it was good. God saw that it was good. It was good. God saw that it was good. It was very good. God's observing. And importantly, God is interpreting. 
what's happening. And what I'm here to suggest is that part of why I think we're so restless and we're so exhausted is because we need a different way of interpreting the world around us. We need a different way of interpreting the activity of God, the activity of each other, even the activity of ourselves. But we see here at the beginning that God models something for us. God's interpretation of God's activity enabled God's rest. I'll talk about the scholar who really helped me get here, which is Walter Brueggemann, an Old Testament scholar. But he's talking so much in this book, Sabbath as Resistance, about how God begins by seeing what God creates as good and then not feeling the impulsion to con continually create, to continually keep it up. If God always had to be at work, then there would be no rest. There would have been no seventh. Life wouldn't have continued after day six if God had to constantly be attentive to every small detail. What Brueggemann is getting at is that there's a system that God creates, all kinds of systems that God creates that are good. And ideally, we would have lived in that. Now, of course, we haven't lived in those systems. We haven't lived in that sense of good. But that need to interpret, to reinterpret, to see what creation has as good already is so vital to our sense of self. How much of our exhaustion comes from seeing ourselves not as good, from mistrusting each other and seeing the, just the deep evil in one another and thinking we have to do everything, overfunction, micromanage, be restless in systems of deep oppression, not only intrapersonal, but interpersonal and systemic. The restlessness on this side of the colonial moment is also part of this, seeing a deep evil, seeing deep needs, seeing the need for extraction and exploitation. And so I'm interested in trying to recover through this hermeneutic of rest, a sense of what God had at the beginning, a sense that creation was good and that therefore we can rest, not only on Sabbath, but how can rest be a way of life, a way of interpreting all around us? And so this is what's at stake for me. During these exhausting times, Christians can receive God's gracious rest through how we interpret texts, how we question, and how we make. We can develop and sustain a hermeneutic of rest. Taken together, the way we interpret texts, scriptural and otherwise, the way we ask questions, and the way we make, taken together, that ends up creating a way of seeing the world, even a habitus of rest, one that enables us to see each other and see ourselves and see God in this beautiful, what I'll show is this interlocking web of rest that is presented in scripture for us to engage and enjoy and also share with the world. Now, I'll break this sentence down going little bit by little bit, first starting with during these exhausted times. And so even though I'm sure all of us have many a reason for why we're all exhausted, I'm curious in sharing a few from some research I've been doing. So this is the resonance or the resonances of restlessness. And before going on, I wanna say that just like how restfulness can beget more restfulness, so too can restlessness beget restlessness. And we're gonna see that by looking at Hobbes, the philosopher, 17th century political philosopher, who was huge on asserting the need for a monarch. Also look at Walter Brueggemann, who I mentioned at the beginning. Also look at this amazing, amazing cat, Christina Sharp, who wrote this book, In the Wake on Blackness and Being, which is a critical text looking at how we live in the afterlife of slavery and the afterlife of, po of property. And then almost as dessert is this English professor who wrote this amazing book about sleep and how sleep since contact in the colonial moment and since has been so radically altered and has been also a means for oppression. And so these are some of the texts that I use to get into the sense of restlessness, the ways in which we are deeply exhausted. And so I want to first start with Hobbes. Hobbes overall in Leviathan is talking about what the needs are for a society, for an absolute sovereign. He ultimately argues that our nature is not such that we can rule ourselves, but rather we need to enter into a social contract. He's often credited as being behind the social contract theory. We need to enter into that in order to then have any kind of abiding society together. His ultimate goal was to really assert and get behind the monarch which was ruling in England at the time. And so even though we don't live necessarily in that kind of society, we still do deal with a lot of the issues that Hobbes brought up because as you might recall, if you've heard this elsewhere, 
Hobbes is responsible for saying life is nasty, brutish, and short. And you can certainly make a case that our economic policies and political, as well as some of our theological anxieties, emerge from this way of looking at life as a place of deep scarcity. I'll return to this phrase, scarcity, later when talking about a favorite theologian of mine, another artist theologian, Mako Fujimura. So with that as a framing, hear these words now from Hobbes, who's talking about sleep. He's talking about sleep and the anxiety that we have and the deep vulnerability that we can't get away from because we all have to become protectionless when we sleep. It may seem strange to you if you haven't thought about hard, hard about these things that nature should thus separate men from one another and make them apt to invade and destroy one another. So perhaps you won't trust my derivation of this account from the nature of the passions and will want to have the account confirmed by experience. Well then, think about how you behave, he's talking to his readers, when going on a journey, you arm yourself and try not to go alone. When going to sleep, you lock your doors. Even inside your own house, you lock your chests. And you do all this when you know that there are laws and armed public officers of the law to revenge any harms that are done to you. Ask yourself, what opinion do you have of your fellow subjects when you ride armed, of your fellow citizens when you lock your doors? profound concept that stood out to me when I was studying philosophy in undergrad because I started to see here how he was moving from an understanding of the human, from an anthropology, into this sense of society based on anxiety, right? We move with anxiety because we can't trust one another not to steal from each other or kill each other in our sleep, including the king, we need to have a sovereign. And so elsewhere in this text, he even talks about how the king needs to have all kinds of guards around him at night to protect him because he even is defenseless when he sleeps. So deep in the premise, the underlying premise of this work is Hobbes' pre um, preoccupation with this anxiety, with this restlessness of society that needs to be subdued by a sovereign. I think this is quite relevant to us as we see the rise of authoritarianism the world over and even see the ways democracy is questioned here and question even the fundamental tenets of democracy. Who is the we? Who can resort to the law? who is able to have people come protect them. These are deep anxieties that we'll now see in a couple of texts later resound in the ways in which black life is often seen as being fugitive, as without home, as without rest, because some of the suppositions here that Hobbes is talking about are present and aren't even achievable for everybody in the society. So Hobbes is one example, one guide for me in terms of the restlessness of society, but here is another, Brueggemann is talking about Sabbath and ultimately he's trying to get to a vision where Christians reclaim Sabbath, lamenting the ways in which Sabbath has either been distorted as being a way of having draconian laws in small town in the South as he talks about at the beginning of the book, or it's just utterly jettisoned by others and we have no sense of a rhythm wherein work is not the only thing we do. And so Brueggemann is really trying to get us to understand the ways we can be like Pharaoh we can have a restlessness within us that leads to others building bricks without straw. And so he's pushing against that and pushing against the ways in which our rhythms reify the system of restlessness. So from, with that as a framing, here's a quote from Brueggemann. The demands of market ideology depend on the generation of needs and desire that will leave us endlessly restless, inadequate, unfulfilled, and in pursuit of that which may satiate desire, the rat race of such predation and usurpation is a restlessness that issues inescapably in anxiety that is often at the edge of being unmanageable. When pursued vigorously enough, moreover, one is propelled to violence against the neighbor and eagerness for what properly belongs to the neighbor. Now, the reason he's talking about the neighbor and violence is because he's arguing that the Sabbath right in the middle of the Decalogue serves as a way to stop short these systems of violence and coveting that keep the community of Israel from having homeostasis. You can't covet all the time if you actually stop from economic production. You can't be desirous of violence if you're actually praising God on the day off. So this is part of the logic that he extends throughout his book is to say that Sabbath, the day as such, is a way for us to stop short these habits of constant, constant anxiety and restlessness, not unlike what Hobbes was just talking about with the anxiety that keeps people up at night. Now, speaking of keeping up at night, we must turn now to Christina Sharp, who is writing a brilliant book about how we are living in the afterlife of slavery. 
And in this book, she's talking about how the waves behind a ship that initially, in terms of the design of the ship, were meant to be as small as possible so as to minimize the amount of water that the ship had to cut through. In terms of trauma of slavery, they're actually made to be as wide as possible. And so she's flipping on its head the way wake is understood, using all of these definitions of wake and holding them together to make this case for how we continue to live in the wake of slavery, but then also how we can do wake work, how we can care for one another and resist the ways in which the wake makes black life illegible, fungible, and ultimately marked for death. And so, in this, she's giving all kinds of annotations throughout the book, talking about the ways in which black life is still playing out these patterns from the slave ship, from this sense of chattel property. And so this text that I'm about to read, this quote, this annotation points to, in 2012, a moment where you see this restlessness not only at play for her, but also at play for the white person who's on the other side of the door, literally and figuratively. And so remember the essential premise for this part. Restlessness begets restlessness. Because of what was restless in terms of European privation and extraction that continues to happen in the ways that anti-blackness shows up, that then leads to a restlessness for black folk, for other kinds of folk, and a restlessness for white folk. So it's, she's really talking about how this goes back and forth. Again, the resonances of restlessness. So here this quote. Quotation, on October 29, 2012, on Staten Island, New York, Glenda Moore looked for and was refused shelter during Hurricane Sandy. That particular refusal resulted in the drowning deaths of her sons, Connor and Brendan, aged two and four, and her condemnation by many as an unfit mother. What, they demand, was she doing out in that storm? What kind of mother was she? Not only that, but when the white man who denied her shelter was asked why he didn't open the door to that distraught black woman who repeatedly pounded on it for help, he said that he did not see a black woman at all, but a big black man, and that he was forced, therefore, to spend the night with his back against the door to prevent entry and thereby his own violation. She's pounding on the door all night. Her sons are drowning. He's up all night out of fear of this big black man on the other side of the door. This quotation, this story, this anecdote, this annotation speaks to the deep restlessness that exhausts all of us. He ain't sleeping, and now she's being deemed an unfit mother who now has to bury her children. This is the kind of deep restlessness that we see in these times. And again, it's begetting one another a fear, and then we can get into a whole other conversation about gender here, because she's not a man, right? But the fear that he had of this uh, presumed man on the other side of the door kept him up afraid of the same thing that haunted Hobbes. Don't you lock your door? Don't you lock your chests when you go out? Even when you're in your home, you lock up. We're locking up, we're locking up, and it's exhausting us. Now, last but not least, this is also a theme about sleep. And what I hope you're noticing is that sleep and death and violence, they're all fitting together. This constant preoccupation even with work, they're, they're constantly going together. The resonances of restlessness. And so this last text comes from this uh, English professor, Benjamin Rice, down at Emory, who wrote this amazingly imaginative book talking about how sleep has changed not only since the colonial moment, but also really since the Industrial Revolution as we know it. How we now have a completely different sense of the patterns. We don't wake up with the sun because of artificial light, which he says beautifully colonizes the night, colonizes the dark. We have a different sense of how our rhythm should be because now we were once woken up by the sun, now we're woken up by the factory bell, and now it's often by iPhones. So there are all these rhythms that have shifted. And he's looking at that not only as it relates to society writ large, but then also how it relates to the way in which certain groups are manipulated per sleep. And you may even want to put this now in conversation with what Sharp was saying about the wake. Offering a frightening view of what sleep looked like on the other side of normal is the story of how sleep was managed, controlled, and systematically manipulated on slave plantations. If slaves helped build the modern world, they were never afforded sufficient rest from the toils involved. 
nor were they afforded the privacy that, according to the sociologist Norbert Elias, was becoming a hallmark of Western bourgeois sleep. And once excluded from normal sleep, they were punished for failures to maintain alertness and productivity and branded as constitutionally lazy for any sign of exhaustion. So they're exhausted, we're exhausted, they were punished for being exhausted. The wake, living in the wake of the slave ship, in the waves that come out from it, but then also, as Sharp is talking about, literally having to stay awake, right? So there's a wakefulness that Sharp is talking about here that aligns with and gives voice to what Rice is talking about here in terms of the ways that black folk were not allowed to sleep. All of these are ways of showing how restlessness begets restlessness. And this is part of what's at stake for me in trying to figure out the sounds in the deep, because this is some deep stuff. This is some deep chaos. And the word in Genesis, at the beginning of Genesis, that is used to describe the deep, tohu vavohu, doesn't have any direct meaning in English. We just get <laughs> chaos, we get matter, watery mass, all these definitions. But we typically call it the deep. And so this is some of the deep that we're in, this deep restlessness. And yet and still, God is present. We'll get to God in a second. But before we do that, I want to talk about the hermeneutic of rest, because this term, hermeneutic, is what's key to this. I've been describing this far how restlessness is present, how we can see that, how we live it, how we feel it, and how it resonates with other kinds of restlessness. And now I want to shift into how we interpret texts, because part of what I think is also at stake here is not just these actions, these economic systems, a political understanding from Hobbes and the like, but it's also a way that we read. It's a way that we interpret the world, and particularly those formed in theological spaces of education. This is quite important because hermeneutics, the term, this understanding of study and interpretation, is particularly widespread in our work in education, in how we understand reading the Bible, reading commentaries. We're constantly looking to employ interpretations and methods thereof. Now, often what I saw while I was in school, both undergrad and grad, was just focusing on the text itself. But what I'm curious about also is how this helps our formation. When we read in a certain way, how does that actually form our souls, form our understanding of self, form our understanding of community? It's not just us in a page, it's us and our souls, and that shows up in how we treat our spouses, how we treat our children, how we treat the earth. Our formation is happening in this ecosystem. And so here on this page, we have some, view, some forms of, um, of interpretation. I won't go through all of them, but these are all ways that in modernity, from literary theory and cultural studies, there have emerged these ways of reading texts. Now, I'm not going to go through and disregard any of these or critique any of these, except maybe the last one, which we see in the social media era. But that is to say, the hermeneutics of suspicion and post-structuralism and critique and deconstruction and genealogy, these are all ways of pointing to systems of power. And they can help us see power, and they can help us see the ways in which power is at play and dominance remains, and we need to read text in ways that really push against that. And one of the main ways we can do that is how we read scripture. So I, I appreciate that, and it's helped a lot of people, including those that look like me, have new ways of understanding how to interpret text. Sure. But by the same token, what I'm also noticing, and I've noticed in notes of rest, and I've been hearing and really sensing is that these ways of reading can also lead to deep anxiety, that this can also become a way of restlessness where we're constantly concerned about lifting up the veil from somebody's false consciousness, as was the case for Ricoeur, who was putting together the studies of Mark, for Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche to come up with hermeneutics of suspicion. Let's be suspicious. Why did they write that? What are they really talking about? Who's going to be at that dinner? Right? It's, that, it's all the same kind of logic that's at play, and this kind of hypervigilance, which can be a means of survival, can also run us into the ground and lead to deep exhaustion. So we can't just look at economic systems and systems of extraction and privation and just look at the ways that we act as economic agents or political agents with one another or even members of a church. We also need to look at how we view the world, how we interpret text, because that is a way in which we create energy around each other, and that can also beget restlessness. Now, in case you're just wondering if this is just a uh, moment of modernity or a problem of modernity, I want to take you a little back to oldie but goodie, to the book of Genesis chapter 3. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. 
He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? So this isn't a new phenomenon of having a deep anxiety or a sense of questioning that can actually take you away from the heart of God. This is extremely old. So it's not only a historical matter or one of literary studies that I'm talking about. This is deeply theological of how we understand what it means to hear from God, to interpret what God has said, and to move in the world with all the texts and all the systems that we're a part of. We know how the story goes from here, where the system that God had created, one that allowed God to rest on the seventh day, is now one in which Adam and Eve are going to have anything but this nice, peaceful existence. And in fact, now they're going to be on the move. Now they're moving into a posture of restlessness that's then going to distort how they read text, how they read each other. We know what happens to their sons, Cain and Abel. There's all kinds of distortion in economic policy and political policy that comes on the other side of this initial moment of restlessness. And so questions that I have for us right now, because this is deeply what's at stake for me in my contemplative retreats, is how is my soul being formed in this combat? We are on the battlefield for something. We're fighting in some kind of war. And in that state, we can think not at all about our souls and can really neglect those. Yesterday, Lenicia, who's here, uh, had a wonderful conversation with Dr. Bowler from Duke about no cure for being human, and just all the ways in which the wars that are around us can actually leave us feeling extremely empty, and we limp along as a result. These are deep questions that we need to ask if we really want to contend with the restlessness of our day and age. How is my soul, based on how I'm reading texts, based on how I'm engaging social media, how is my soul, based on the ways that I stay up all night with my gun and ignore the person pounding on the door asking for their sons to come in from the cold? How is my soul formation in the midst of this restlessness? The second question is, is this interpretation process encouraging restlessness or restfulness? So post-structuralism, genealogy, deconstruction, the list goes on. You can be talking about power, sure, but how is it drawing you into restfulness? Or is it drawing you towards restlessness? Now, I have intentionally not describe directly yet what restfulness is, because I want to save the shouting moment for the end. But I want us to right now think about this question, because this is a way that will affect you if you're a student, how you read texts. It'll affect how you show up in class. It'll affect how we deal with each other economically. And I'll show ultimately how art can be a way of helping sustain this hermeneutic of rest. But before we get there, we got to go to the literary arts and go to my boy, Augustine. You stir a man to take pleasure in praising you because you have made us for yourself and our heart is restless until it rests in you. The reason I have Augustine here and this passage in particular is because it's at the beginning of Confessions, his seminal work, many would say, next to City of God. And in Confessions, Augustine is talking about his own conversion story, his own ineluctable, God's ineluctable draw on him into the rest of God. But the irony is that even though this is on page one of the text, we have a whole long way to go before God ends up being received, or he ends up, um, Augustine ends up being received by God at the end. And the reason I want to start with this is because it says at the beginning of this passage, you stir man to take pleasure. So the notion of having questions, of really wanting to contend, that's not a problem. What happens is when we move in the way of the serpent, did God really say? And actually end up moving away from the heart of God. And so I'm excited to see how restfulness can come from the questions that we ask, as opposed to the ongoing restlessness that preoccupies and shackles. And so with that, we come to how rest is present in scripture. And I'm arguing that again from the beginning, how we interpret texts combined then with how we make, which we'll get to in a second with Fujimura, how these come together to point us to the grace of God. And so in scripture, rest is an ecosystem. We see all five of these ways present throughout the text. It's alignment with God's will. It's also sleep. It's also death, cessation of work, and cessation of war. And so on the surface, because we started this way, I'm moving to cessation of work. Well, you have all these texts here that talk to how rest can be seen as stopping working. And this is a huge mode for us to think in and move in as we continue to live in a society besieged by constant work. And I'm struggling with what we're all struggling with. 
but we're besieged by constant work and can't see that our work was good and that creation was created with a system that actually would go on even if we stopped. And so because of the restlessness that comes from more and more and more, the extraction, the privation and everything that Sharp and Brueggemann were talking about, we end up moving with a sense of restlessness instead of this deep sense of restfulness of cessation of work. Now, recall here that I was talking earlier about how restlessness begets restlessness, so too is the opposite, where restfulness begets restfulness. So in this case, in Exodus and Deuteronomy, we see that the text talks about how the people of Israel who are now freed are meant to rest. But as they rest, now the people who work for them will get the day off too, and the livestock. And so the earth, the animals, the other people in the economic system and those immediately addressed are all resting. Restfulness begets restfulness. And in the last passage we see here in Isaiah 56, three through five, these words about how restfulness for one also begets restfulness for those who come and join. Now this is in third Isaiah, Trito Isaiah, in which the exiles are coming back from Babylon. They're coming back to Jerusalem and they're trying to now figure out this new community that is this old community. And now joining them are these foreigners who, who are coming in as well. And so these are the words from the prophet. Do not let the foreigner joined to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And do not let the eunuch say, I am just a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name. Better than sons and daughters, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And so we see here that the cessation of work for one is actually leading to the drawing in of the other. Think about this as the reversal of what we saw for Sharp, right? This deep restlessness that kept this door literally between the man with the gun and then the woman, the, mother, the unfit mother, so-called. Restlessness kept them separated. Brueggemann points to how restfulness can actually draw folk together. Restfulness begets restfulness. And cessation of war, it's interesting that throughout the text, particularly in Joshua, we see these words at the end of the passage you see here, and the land had rest from war. This is obviously a very complicated text. You know, I'm time to get into all of it. But even as you look at what's happening in the conquest narratives, it's notable that when you have times of peace, those are called times of rest. And so we see that cessation of war is also there under the guise of rest, as is cessation of work. And then you have this other kind of rest, which is sleep, and as the rapper Lupe says, and many have said, Nas nah, said this too, uh, sleep is the cousin of death. And so sleep and death are here. And we read Matthew 8, 24 yesterday when we were talking about Jesus being asleep in the boat. Jesus, our Lord, we're perishing. So Jesus is asleep and they're worried about dying. And so you see even in that text that the two are together, but more so on the nose, you see in 2 Kings chapter 2, that King David is told to have slept with his ancestors. And this was a very common refrain to talk about death in the Old Testament. And the one I love and have memorized and try to say is, I will both lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, Lord, make me lie down in safety. And so this is a reversal of Hobbes's preoccupation where Hobbes is afraid that we can't sleep, we can't trust each other, uh, and therefore we have to lock and secure and privatize. And what's it mean that instead of because of ADT or some security system or my Glock under the bed, I will both lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. The restlessness that begets more, as Sharp and Brueggemann, et cetera, point out, now is countered by I will lie down and sleep in peace because the Lord protects me. The last one I want to look at is alignment with God's will. Genesis 1 through 2 and Exodus and all these places point to how we can align with God's will. And particularly, I want to focus in on Hebrews, which is talking about, for the New Testament church, it's talking about how the ultimate rest in God is possible for those who want to enter the will. And it says that if Joshua had, had really given the final rest, then there wouldn't be need for anything more. And so they're really contending with how there's something present in Hebrews, something that's present because of what Jesus has done that actually allows for this ultimate rest, that is death, but that is also alignment with God. So the Hebrews are looking past their death to the life to come and seeing how that is also opening onto alignment with God's will. So we see how the restfulness, having an understanding of death that's one not full of fear, but rather full of a confidence and belief in what God can do, can ultimately align you with God's will and have you in the work that Hebrews is trying to do. So alignment with God's will is present there. 
And we see it beautifully present in Exodus 33, 14, where Moses is getting orders from um, the Lord in order to go take care of Israel. And the Lord says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And so God's presence goes with Moses. God's sound goes to Moses, goes into the deep chaos of Israel, and ultimately then gives them rest. And so to sum this part up, we can interpret scripture in a way focused on God's gracious sense of rest. This is a way to create an interpretation method that really is opening on to rest. How am I reading the text in such a way that allows me to have this beautiful back and forth between these various kinds of rest? That's possible, and it can be an impulse that we develop, which isn't to say that the hermeneutic of suspicion is ultimately bad. It is to say, though, that I've noticed in myself and in others, especially if you look on social media, just how there can be so much anxiety because we're constantly looking to deconstruct, constantly looking to flip up the false consciousness of one another, and ultimately just run ourselves ragged. There's a kind of way that we can interpret that actually opens on to rest, the rest of God that leads to sleep, that leads to a sense of purpose aligned with God, that leads to even a proper understanding or healthy understanding of what death is about, that leads to a cessation of work and leads to a cessation of needless conflict. Restfulness begets. And so that brings me to this beautiful next part, because we can have all the interpretations in the world, but one of the things that I see in making music, and Fujimoto really helps me with this in Art and Faith, is that making allows us to sustain this hermeneutic of rest. If we can have, we can create an interpretation all day long, but what is gonna sustain us in that work? What's gonna keep us feeling like we want that, desirous of that? And that is presented in one part through beauty. Beauty is a way of creating and forming our desires. And it wants us to want something. Fred Moten talks about that in a beautiful way when he's talking about black music. And he says that black music creates a, an alternative way of even wanting. And that is a way that we can live with as we think about making. So I've just mentioned Moten. He's not on this page, but he's central to the work as well. Um, but Fujimura's Art and Faith is a guide. And I'll start with him because he's so helpful in helping me understand how we can sustain this posture, sustain this posture that's just, um, about rest. And so here are these words from Fujimura. Now, to get into it, I first got to, of course, give the framing. For Fujimura, what's at stake is understanding this problem that he sees so many Christians have, left, right, doesn't matter, and is, that is plumbing theology. He argues that too often, we're just concerned about fixing the problem immediately in front of us, be it marriages, be it black folk getting killed in communities. We're just trying to fix the problem right in front of us. And so we have the marriage conferences or we do the rallies and we don't ask the deeper question of why they're here in the first place. Why do we even have the pipes in the first place? Or are we just focused on trying to mend them? And so instead of getting to the mending, Fujimura is trying to open us up into this broader understanding of how creating, how making is a way of actually pointing us from Genesis into the new creation that Jesus inaugurated. It's a new creation whenever we make something. And speaking of making, if y'all haven't seen Lanicia's, what she's made, uh, go over to Duke Chapel after this. But what we make is actually a way of pointing to the new creation that God has inaugurated. And that's one that's constantly moving us forward. And again, it can help sustain this hermeneutic, this way of interpreting the world through rest. Christians have many presuppositions about what Christianity is that are often based upon an analytical approach to understanding truth as a set of propositional beliefs such that understanding and explaining take dominance over experiencing and intuiting. But that grounding is based less on a biblical generative path than on the mechanistic post-industrial thinking of utilitarian pragmatism. When we make, we invite the abundance of God's world into the reality of scarcity all about us. Recall at the beginning, I said the word scarcity. I was talking about Hobbes and we have to lock our things, right? Otherwise they'll be stolen. We recall what Sharp was saying and about the wake of the slave ship that we live in and how there's such a scarcity of resources. I can't let him in, him, because what if he takes something from me? What if I actually am subjected to violation? There's a deep scarcity that preoccupies modernity. And what Fujimura is saying here is that we can actually get past that, or that is get before that, and look at a different kind of abundance that comes into the world through making. Fujimura is all about trying to help us see that all of us can make, 
all of us create in such a way that actually allows us to see the goodness of God, that allows us to see what the abundance that comes from within. So for those of y'all who were with me on yesterday, you saw that at the end, after we spent time in the text, we had our little discussion, we also then had a time where you could have created if you wanted to. I called that wellsprings. That's coming from this. That's coming from this hermeneutic of rest that now you're able to sustain by desiring to create something. Dang, I just played that, let me play that again. Right, or I just painted that, or she painted that, and that's beautiful, let me look at that. That's actually creating something that we wanna desire, that we wanted to see. And that's part of the beauty and the power of the arts. That the arts can help sustain ways of living, sustain ways of being, because beauty wants us to look at it. Beauty wants us to see it. Beauty wants us to engage it. It wants us to do that over and over. And so the restfulness that can come from this kind of fulsome engagement, that restfulness leads to a way of, we can, we can create in a way that actually leads to wanting to work less, that leads to wanting not to be in conflict. As we look at things that are beautiful that come from joining as opposed to come from the rending apart. And so for me, being a musician, I'm doing this by looking at the mechanics of music. And so this is kind of pulling back the hood on what I was talking about yesterday, or not talking about so much as doing. One thing that I'm doing when I'm playing for you in a notes of rest session is that I'm creating familiarity through what are known as transitional objects. So this is from a social psychologist D.W. Winnicott, who's talking about how when people are in moments of fear, when they're not really sure what's going on, this looks unfamiliar, I don't know you, what you look like, or where are we? Holding on to things like a blankie for a two-year-old, right? For Linus fans out there from um, Charlie Brown, holding on to your blankie, sucking your thumb, these are transitional objects that help you move into the unfamiliar. And so when you're going into the space and notes that Notes of Rest creates, where we're thinking about what it means to be still, that might be unfamiliar for you. But the work that I've been doing with this organization, Fearless Dialogues, has helped me see the work, the power of having a transitional object of something that I can hold on to that actually allows me to ease into something new. So in the case for me, when I'm making, I'm making these tunes that y'all know. I was doing that before we started the lecture. I was playing songs that just based on who was here and what I could sense, I figured you would know. Playing hymns, playing spirituals, playing Richard Smallwood. These were strategic because they're ways of actually drawing you into the space to help you with the perhaps unfamiliarity of what's this guy gonna talk about, what sounds in the deep, what, what's a hermeneutic? These are ways of drawing you in. So it's creating a space that allows now for you to actually have a space of restfulness as opposed to the restlessness that comes from the anxiety of not knowing what's around the corner. The next thing I wanna note here is the extrinsic value of a note. And this is a key note that I like to play up on because the way I make primarily is by playing music without words. Now, Dr. Bebe here has done great work in theology, music, and time, where he's looking at how music doesn't have, sorry, notes on their own, notes qua notes, don't have intrinsic meaning. We have to ascribe meaning. So you might have heard total praise and the amen at the end. You might have just heard a lot of noise. You might have heard a crescendo. You might have heard your grandma. You might have heard any of these things. It's not overdetermined, even though those notes have lyrics assigned to them, actually because of the intrinsic property of a note, you actually have to do the work of applying meaning to it. So if I just went over there and played D, it would just be a D. But if I start playing notes around it, now you're starting to think, well, that sounds like this. This sounds like a horror movie. This sounds like that love song where I met my wife for the first time. We're ascribing value. And so that can help draw you into a state of rest because it can actually take you away from all the extra thinking that you need to do. Part of the reason why I don't sing that well, so that's also why I don't sing. Part of the reason I also don't sing is because I want you to just be able to take what you need, not work too hard, right? There's so much space where we have to be analyzing and, and trying to figure things out and assessing and what does that lyric mean? Just give you space. Connected to that is one of my favorite thinkers right now, who is Barbara Holmes. She is this incredible um, contemplative, black contemplative, who's looking at and trying to recover the ways in which black folk have been living out communal contemplation. It just looks very different than Eurocentric ways. And so in this text, Barbara Holmes is really saying what's at stake for us is understanding the power of having communal contemplation, the power of having a way of coming together and understanding how we can be aware of the abundance from within and how we shout, 
in how we read and how we shake hands, how we even crack jokes. One way, though, that she talks about it in a beautiful way is in terms of music. And I'll get to that in a second. But the last thing I'll say here on this slide is that Begbie also shows us in that same book how we can become comfortable with rhythms of tension and resolution. So in, in the way I play on those of rest sessions, I'm making in a way that allows you to have this sense of, okay, we're having some tension, and now ah, we're resolving. Now, in other settings, like for my band, the Juju Exchange, that, that uh, tension might last for a whole long time. And you're like, I don't know where I'm going. What's that sound? Where, where that come from? Is that a bird? You know, and I love that too, right? So this, this is another side of me. But here in this case, for notes of rest, I want to give you sounds that allow you to have some tension because that's what all of our lives are filled with, but then moves to the resolution that we can have. And hopefully in that way, the way that I make actually then begets restfulness for you. Now, the one I skipped over here is how the way you, I play can leave space for wonder and awe to emerge. And that's so key for the restfulness. We, if we had time, we'd go back and look at those quotes from Hobbes, ain't no wonder there. Ain't no awe there. From Sharp, there is no wonder there. There was pain, deep tragedy, right? But then also a desire to try to look at the mother, look at her in her state. So we were using that as a site of care but the wonder and awe wasn't there. We can go on down the line. But what Holmes talks about at the end of her book when talking about art is that music can be an amazing way, and art writ large can be an amazing way to engender wonder and awe. And that's what I'm trying to do in Notes of Rest. That's what I try to do with my band, The Juju Exchange. And so this will be one of the last things I read. These artistic genres are contemplative because they ignite memories of the awe and wonder that we tend to discard after childhood. Art also carves pathways towards our inner aisles of spirituality. When we decide to live in our heads only, we become isolated from the God who is closer than our next breath. To subject everything to rational analysis reduces the awe to ashes. Let me read that again, given what we're talking about with interpretation. To subject everything to rational analysis reduces the awe to ashes. The restoration of wonder is the beginning of the inward journey toward a God who people of faith of air is always waiting in the seeker's heart. A hermeneutic of rest, an ability to interpret the world towards a state of rest, it really relies on us having ways of sustaining this posture. And we can sustain this posture by really holding to wonder and awe. And that's what I'm trying to create and that's what I'm also listening for when I'm going to see art, when I'm going to listen to other artists. This is a picture that really does so much to describe what this whole lecture has been about. This, um, I don't know when this picture was taken, but I attended this church with my wife in Atlanta the Sunday after the Charleston massacre. Dylan Roof had just gone into a black church, a black Methodist church at that, and had after Bible study, shot up. Again, the waves, the wake, the waves, the wake. Now, here we are going to a big old black church a few days after that in the South. We're some Yankees. Actually, my wife is from Canada, so even worse, so to speak. Uh, we're way north. I'm from Chicago. We, were, we met in Connecticut, and then we moved down to Atlanta. And so just the South is just this whole new thing for us, right? All these questions, this restlessness, right, that's within. But we wanted to go and said, if those folk were brave enough to go on Wednesday after Wednesday, so too can we. So we went. So powerful. We went and we sung the songs of Zion together. And I'll just never forget how, on one hand, I was in awe. It, this was a moment, again, as Holmes is talking about, this wonder and awe emerging. But I'm also kind of terrified. Looking around, you know, okay, where's the exit? Who could come in? Black space is always, as Sharp is saying, is always marked for this kind of violation. And yet, what I saw in there that really started to tip me off to this way, this other way of thinking, this other way of being, is how these black folk who've been doing this, how they were singing the songs of Zion, and that power felt so strong. It felt so strong, and their restfulness of them was rubbing off on me. 
the way that they were making music together was rubbing off on me. And I could tell how it was sustaining us. This music wasn't just perfunctory. This was really sustaining us. Something was really at stake for us being there. To put our lives on the lines like this, the music was sustaining this hermeneutic of rest, this way of interpreting the text, way of interpreting scripture, way of interpreting the world. It was sustaining a way of drawing us together, of desiring to be with each other, knowing even still what the cost might be. And I don't know if y'all remember, but in those years, you know, Dylan Roof and then all the burnings of the churches around the South, I mean, it's crazy. And those were, of course, just the ones that, you know, folk actually hear about, to say nothing about what happens behind closed doors back in the woods or wherever. And so this picture is, in iconic form, what I've been talking about in textual form and musically. This picture shows how this kind of community, this kind of communion, is a way of engendering and sustaining this hermeneutic of rest. And so I'll end the way I began. At stake during these exhausting times, Christians can receive God's gracious rest through how we interpret texts, how we question, and how we make. We can develop and sustain a hermeneutic of rest. This is a picture, this is my album artwork from my album, Rest Assured. And on this, picture you see the sparrow from Matthew chapter 6. Do not worry. And Jesus is saying this as one living under colonial occupation from Rome. And he's saying this to people who were part of a people group very destitute. Maybe a few of them had a few coins, but they just actually left that to follow him. <laughs> and so now you're talking to people who didn't have that much, who have even left what they had to follow you and be homeless and move around. And Jesus is saying, don't worry. This is a way for us to live. My friend Shin Meng did this piece, and it's a way of sustaining a kind of posture of moving into the restfulness of God that doesn't ignore what Sharp or Brueggemann or even Hobbes are talking about, but rather says we can counter that with the posture of restfulness that begets restfulness. And so as you all prepare your questions, I'm just going to play uh, one little hymn that I played uh, yesterday. Give me Jesus, as you reflect on what it means to not worry. Amen. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. My, my own question before the others. What are the objects? Oh, so Shin was telling me that those are the beliefs and the hopes and the dreams of the bird, then becoming the sustenance underneath. I see, all right. So it's actually coming down now to yeah. Yes, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got time for questions. Let's have some. We have a roving mic as well, just to make sure. So, uh, good afternoon, Julian. My name is Cleve. I had a chance to meet you. First, I just want to say... Um, how much I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Um, you did so much with which I want to engage. Um, but because it's Black History Month and we still got people's attention for a while, I'm going to ask you a personal question yeah. for you and for me as well, right? And I want, I want to use the lens that you came through with Sharp and Moulton. For you, a, a theophilosophical question for you, 
In what ways would you say your phenomenology, phenomenology of spirit or black spirit um, is able to disrupt the kind of move to reducing everything to rationality mm. and provides a sort of restfulness? In what ways does the black spirit for you mm -hmm. uh, give you this restfulness? And what does it offer? You talked about how Christians can rest. But I want us to point more toward what yeah. black spirit does here. Uh, that's great. Thank you. If we had more time, I would have talked more about wake work that Sharp was talking about. And for me, one of the things that I saw her doing, even in just how she annotates, is that she speaks to the stories of black life in a way with unmitigated gall about what has happened, and yet never in a way that is about object, but ultimately about holding these people as tender, tender objects of care. Um, and I do say that word object kind of out of both sides of my mouth because on one hand, they're not objects, but then on the other hand, part of her logic is we are objects. And understanding and recognizing that allows us to see each other and hold to each other and tend to each other. And I see her doing that throughout that book. She's tending to that so-called unfit mother. She's tending to those boys who drowned by sharing their story, by pointing to how they were ensconced in a whole system of death. And she points to them and ultimately pushes against that. And I try to do that too, to recognize that, to recognize what we're up against, how our backs are up against the wall to use Howard Thurman's language, and to then see each other and do that nod. Do that nod with how I play, do that nod with how I show up and give you depth, uh, do that nod with how I recognize and chronicle our story. So yeah, that's some of what's going on for me in the phenomenology of black spirit. Yeah, so thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, much. Directly. Thank you, brother, for the presentation. Um, in in light of Hobbes and mm. Fujimura, mm. um, how do you um, conceptualize what beauty means? What what is beauty? Beauty means beauty. Wow. That's an awesome question. Um, thinking about that in terms of Hobbes. Yeah, and Fujimura. I think beauty is creating in a way that can ultimately make us wonder about more than our anxieties. That might mean actually drawing us into them. You know, I think people can create incredibly anxiety-inducing work that's still beautiful. But I have often understood beauty, studying Plato, studying Nietzsche, um, and these others in terms of aesthetics, in terms of actually calling us into a space where there is no need for addition. And what I see with Hobbes, if I, as I'm thinking out loud, is that so much of what Hobbes is up against and trying to get us to see is how much we need to give away for the sake of ultimate um, conferring over to this power all this power, when ironically, that power is also deeply anxious. And so I see on that view of Leviathan that the king, the one who can be the despot over everybody, he's also afraid when he sleeps. Now Hobbes tries to get around this by saying that ultimately the king is under God, and so he's trying to appeal to these, these kind of uh, understandings of royal ideology coming from the Old Testament, but it still, it still falls flat. I think, is you try to give all this power to one cat. And we see how that power can lead to all kinds of crumbling, the exact opposite of beauty. So yeah, I'm, I'm trying to see beauty as something other than that. And I think Fujimura is about that too, that the new creation, which we can see in part now, is actually opening onto this deep place of wonder and awe uh, instead of the kind of anxieties that keep people locking their chests and doors at night. Thank you. It's a great, great question. And that I can't help thinking the new creation is where we start to mm. think about beauty mm. as Christians. Mm. It's from there beauty shines, mm. so to speak. By the way, on the sleep thing, I just can't help thinking of the Ukraine situation at the moment, looking at so many reports. Mm. They say, we slept but didn't sleep, you know, the first night. It was just extraordinarily resonant with, with what you were saying as wow. well. 
It's the kind of the sleep of the anxious. Yes, yes, Think yes. Think of the whole country, the yeah. sleep of the anxious. I mean, people can get eight hours of sleep and not be rested. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, Dean. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. um, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I'm thinking about the, as an artist or a musician, um, the how difficult it can be sometimes to resist having restlessness in the making. Ah, uh, yeah itself can become laborious or something that you really have to work at. Um, you know, the chord doesn't resolve in the way you need it to and you just have to labor over getting to that, that resolution. How do you balance that um, art being a place of both rest and mm. restlessness and how do you resist um, it just being a totalizing restless place? Man, that is really close to home. Thank you, thank you for asking that. Because I think it's not only about restlessness in the act of creating, uh, but as I'm sure Lunicia can relate, it's also in the act of sustaining the work. I mean, and just how often artists are marginalized and we live in the nooks and crannies of systems. Our work is both praised, but then also condemned. And it's both like fetishized, but then we, people don't want to pay for it. And we, you know, it's really hard for artists to make livings. That can then redound to the kind of anxiety that then happens with the chord when you're like, I, right, you know, I'm trying to pay bills even and still, you know, I can't figure out how this chord should actually fit. And so I think when that happens, I actually come back to my breathing. One thing I was talking about last night in, the, in a talk back was how, in addition to the communal contemplation that Holmes was talking about that I was doing at the end, there are also these personal practices that I really try to hold to as well. Um, and one of those is just trying to breathe deep. And whenever I find myself getting anxious when I'm soloing or when I'm playing, I try to come back to my breath, focus on it. And then that starts to calm me down, realizing that ultimately I'm doing this because of God first. So God created, and now I, re I create in response. Another thing I'll say, and this gets to what Arthur was asking about Fujimura, is one thing that's key to Fujimura's thinking, a central tenet, is that God didn't have to create us. God didn't. You know, there's a beautiful, I love God's trombones. Uh, by James Weldon Johnson, beautiful, beautiful oration and just imaginative, speculative work around what God was doing. I'm gonna make me a man, you know, is what is um, his reading of what God was doing when God looked out on creation and saw that he was lonely. Well, that's nice, but it's, it's not actually clear from the text that God needed to make us so God wouldn't feel alone, um, but rather to see that God freely makes us then allows me to think about creation as a free act, as opposed to one that's earning my rest or earning my keep. Um, and Fujimura is really big on that. But I, what I'm doing is I'm trying to take Fujimura and now draw him into this bigger conversation about rest, to say that when we create, not only are we making into the new creation or from the new creation, but we're also making in a way that can actually have us live in this concatenation, this interlocking of all these ways of understanding rest that I was talking about from scripture, alignment cessation of work, cessation of conflict. And if I remember that God didn't have to make me, but that God chose to make me, then as I'm making, even if it's work, even if it's commodity in some way, because it's a Spotify stream, it's ultimately hopefully still coming from that free place. I want to make from freedom. And so that's how I try to live. Yeah. Easier said than done. It's <laughs> <laughs> Brett at the back there. Oh, sorry, it was Warren. Okay, Warren first. Warren Smith, uh, professor of church history, mm. somewhat obsessed with the early church. <laughs> Dr. Reed, thank you. I mean, this was, this was rich. Um, I don't know if I have so much a question, but thoughts that you've stimulated in me. And I'm thinking specifically about the Augustine. And Augustine's mm. image of the pilgrim, the yeah. we're all on pilgrimage, and the way in which to be on pilgrimage is inherently to be restful, mm. uh, to be restless. Mm -hmm. And therefore there, I think he does operate with a distinction, he, he doesn't make it, but between a hopeful restlessness mm. and a hopeless restlessness. Ah. Uh, in that all of us, you know, in, in the state before the state of grace, mm -hmm. without grace, are hopelessly restless. And that's his, the young Augustine in, you know, in Carthage, desperately looking for someone to love. Yeah, oh yes. <laughs> um, as opposed to then uh, the hope, 
full restlessness of a people in exile. Right. I'm thinking of Psalm 137. You know, if I forget you, O Jerusalem. Yeah. And, so, and, and that gets back to then your point at the end about singing the songs of Zion as the thing that we find rest, that's where our restlessness uh, has its hopeful dimension. Oh, that's beautiful. And, you know, thank you for that, Doctor. That was, that's making me think actually about something else I've seen in blues music. So when black folk were denied freedom and equality um, after they were emancipated in the 1860s, they, there emerged over the next couple decades this kind of music known as the blues. Now, one thing that's interesting about the blues is that the blues doesn't resolve really ever. So the blues comes on chords, I'd play it, but I don't want to go back and forth, but the blues plays on these chords that actually are meant to resolve elsewhere. But the home chord in a blues is one that's meant to point to a home chord elsewhere. So instead of it being a C major seven to speak quickly in specific terms, it's a C dominant seven, which really should be going to F major seven, which if we were playing Hayden, Haydn or Mozart, that would be the ending. Right? Those cats are rarely ending on the dominant, especially in that era um, of Renaissance music and classical music. So that's all happening in, in black music. And what's interesting is it points to this constant restlessness. You can read it, right? We're not home. And you ain't got to ask, you ain't have to talk long to black folk to realize there's a sense of not being at home. And I was saying this earlier, Moton talked a lot about fugitivity and black folk always being on the move, always in transition, always trying to figure out how to make things work. That can be a hopeful restlessness, though, as opposed to giving into or capitulating to the despair. And that's what I showed in that picture, right, of us singing the songs, right? That, that we knew what could happen. And that was either the week at, right after Dylan Roof or it was a year after. But either way, it felt like it was the same, same time. We knew that somebody could come in and shoot us up that moment, right? That's terrifying. And yet we sang those songs with that restlessness, hopeful about a God that we sang to. Um, so, so thank you for saying that, and it's a really cool way of reading about the presence of grace in Augustine. Thank you for that. Thank you, Warren, very much. Brett. I want to start off with a word of thanks and then pivot to a question. First, thank you for, for giving us language around rest as a hermeneutic lens. I especially find it useful because the way that you're talking about rest doesn't get rid of some of those more critical lenses but rather can adapt and assimilate them. Yes. So to ask about rest, who gets to rest, what forms of rest are foregrounded or foreclosed, means that you can think in terms of power dynamics. Yes. Never, they never become the end. A sort of holistic rest is always the end that's in the distance, and I think it's such a good move to make. So thank you mm. for giving me language for that. The, the question I have in light of that is I'm thinking about the account of Sabbath. So you yeah. have six days where, where God works, mm -hmm. six days where God labors, and then a day where God rests. And I think of these rabbinic commentators thinking about the work given to the people of Israel as mm -hmm. the repair of the world or the restoration of the world to which they're invited into a kind of participation. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Hobbes, and I, I sense Locke in the background too, that we're sort of implicated in this logic where the effect of work is a sort of claiming of property. It's improvement for the purpose of setting up borders, claiming what is mine, mm -hmm. but not yours. And I wonder how much a hermeneutic of rest has to depend on an alternative or a different hermeneutic of work as well. Mm. So I wonder if you can speak mm. to that or riff on that for a moment. That's beautiful, and I love that word riff as a nod to the music. Yes, I think that property, and Jennings here is, really Jennings is, really helpful in talking about how we don't get the colonial moment and our cartography of race that emerges without this deep sense of private property. And you're right to detect Locke because central to John Locke's understanding of the human was the ability to own. And so if you couldn't own, which women couldn't do and black show couldn't do, then you weren't human. And we see that that haunts us uh, still. And so I think that we need this alternative kind of understanding of property and what's mine is mine versus what's yours or yours. This is where I think it's really helpful to look at indigenous histories. There's this book that I almost included, but I only had so much time to include the few books I did. Um, but indigenous people's history of the United States, 
wonderful read by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. And in that, she's talking about the ways that natives had to start having this new sense of property put on them. Jennings in The Christian Imagination also talks about this, and particularly he talks about it in real estate. And so he was saying that before contact, natives didn't have this grid-like system to understand wilderness or land. They had this relationship that was far more um, porous than a grid. And this was a religious mound, or this was where we did this, et cetera. And, but then afterwards, you started to have this sense of property and fencing. And literally the act of being able to fence off land and say, this is mine, this belongs to me, then creates a sense of restlessness because now I have to always protect it. Um, and I do sometimes wonder about just the extent to which nationhood is always about a state of restlessness because you need to have borders um, and have to have a nation. So obviously I'm, I don't have all the answers, but these are some, I think, deep questions around how rest is connected to politics and is connected to our understanding of property and what can be privatized versus what's socialized. Now, one thing I'll say as an appendix is one thing I love about jazz is that property functions very differently in jazz. You can't copyright, for instance, chord changes. And so especially when jazz was emerging as an art form, you had all kinds of songs that were written on the same number of chords. And it's like, oh, I, ain't that that Miles tune? No, nah, no, nah, that's that Miles tune. This is somebody else. Beautiful way to actually get at these different ways of riffing on the same idea because they were sharing more. We were, and there was a different sense of property, a different sense of what it meant to have something private because we had a different end. And so that is a way that black life incarnate in jazz music is presenting a different way of understanding private property, uh, who gets to play even. So thank you. Anything else on that? I'm Uday, yes? One last question from Uday here. Oh. A comment? Good. Well, no, thank you, uh, Julian. Uh, yeah, the whole idea of rest, uh, from, uh, it kind of sparked some thinking that in my own research and from where I'm coming from in the context of uh, neoliberalism and post-colonialism in mm. South Asian context, that mm. rest is actually the space between uh, indigeneity and cosmopolitanism. Oh, wow is inhabited by and characterized by ambiguity and questioning and, uh, and hybridity, actually. Hybridity as a, as a state of rest. Wow. That refuses to be essentialized in any one particular category. This is some of the, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. Great. Wow. Victoria is somewhere. Victoria? Do come up. Come up here, that would be nice, and then we'll hear from So in his books, Meditation of the Heart, Howard Thurman dedicates an entire meditation on the power of rest. He says it's good to make an end of movement, to come to a point of rest, a place of pause. The moment of pause, the point of rest, has its own magic. And over the past few days, the Duke Divinity School community has been blessed to sit with the gift that is Julian Davis Reed. And on behalf of the students, faculty, and staff of this community, thank you. Thank you for carving out time to come and spread the message of rest as a holy practice. From your dynamic chapel presentation where you invited us into a conversation about a napping Jesus and what's at risk as our boats are taking in water, to the wisdom you freely poured out during our informal lunch and learn with the Black Seminarians Union. Your presence has made a lasting impact and today you've challenged us to make. You've encouraged us to examine our souls and as an artist theologian, you have given a concrete example to what it means to live into the hyphens of our life. So in this moment, allow us to do what James Cleveland sang about. Allow us to give you your flowers while you can see the beauty that they bring. So Duke Divinity School, please join me in showing our appreciation for the gift that is Julian Davis Reed. Yeah. 
And so to those of you who joined us in person and those of you who are watching online, thank you. Thank you for honoring the call of God to pause. And so now as we leave this place but never God's presence, may the strength of God sustain us. May the power of God preserve us. May the hands of God protect us. May the ways of God direct us. May the love of God go with us this day and forevermore. And may we embrace the blessing that we have in rest. Amen. Amen.